you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week can go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. Good morning. We're talking about victory in the camp. For those of you who are new with us, uh, welcome to Christ Community Church. We're so glad you're here. We are a charismatic, independent uh, congregation that's made up of a diverse group of people as you look around. And all I can say is that uh, we're just in love with Jesus, and we want him to do great things through our community of faith. We want to see the Lord do amazing things. The healing service we'll have this Friday night. You know, I was watching uh, Christian TV the other day, and there was a show, and I don't remember what it was. All of a sudden, this advertisement came up for this church in Missouri, and they were advertising. They said, if you have anybody that's in a wheelchair, anybody battling incurable diseases like cancer, et cetera, come to our church. The first Sunday of every month, we pray for the sick. And the guy who was doing it looked like a very, uh, like you know, guy my age, coat, looked real nice and proper. But I thought, you know what? I am so excited about what Jesus is doing in our midst. The Lord has poured out his spirit and we are living in an unprecedented age of God just using just ordinary common people to do extraordinarily great things for him. Yeah. So get in on the fun because when Jesus is doing you in supernatural ways, it's just an amazing thing. Let's take just a few minutes and share the word. Let me just tell you where we're at is about this message this morning. I so enjoyed when uh, Jim Bucci was sharing last Sunday. Uh, had some just some moments with his message. But I um, have had this word for several weeks. It's just been sitting with me. And I, so I want to give you a little background before I jump into the message. Uh, I've titled it Victory in the Camp. But I was just feeling overwhelmed and fatigued. So I really appreciate when Nasha was sharing this morning because there were some things I was feeling. I was just, I was struggling with looking at our community, looking at our nation, and just saying, God, I know what you want to do, but this looks like mission impossible. I mean, I feel completely overwhelmed that you, God, have promised us you're going to do certain things. And when I look at where we're at as a nation, we've had a coup attempt on our government. And for those of you who dare to disagree with me, you are entitled to your opinion, but I'm here to tell you, Brother Kenneth Hagin had a word of prophecy back in this, back, I think it was in the late 60s, early 70s, where the Spirit of God came on him and he saw a Marxist, Leninist, socialist spirit attack America. Right. And it looked like America was going down and the Spirit of God ignited and people were able to throw off the Marxist, Leninist spirit. And for those of you who maybe not understand everything, what I'm trying to say is that, in case you don't understand it, communism is not religious. It is a religion, but they are against people of faith. And uh, you're seeing this battle take place. You're seeing churches that have gone completely what I call woke. Uh, they've left the gospel. They've completely moved away. And so, and then I look at just things that are going on in our school system. And I look at things that are going on in our educational system. And I look at things that are going on in our society. And uh, you've got two states now. Let me just, just about to get wound up. But we have, we have two states now that I'm aware of. The state of California, the state of New York. Their state legislatures have passed laws that an infant that is born can be terminated up to, I think, 28 days after their birth. Wow. Wow. Infant killing, infanticide is here, it's upon us. Right. And I'm saying to you people, we are in a battle. That's so true. all this stuff is just washing over me, and I don't know if you heard this, prayers back in schools. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. The satanic club has petitioned the schools to allow prayer back in so they can pray to Satan. And I'm here to tell you that it's like I get stuff like this, and I just get overwhelmed. I just start thinking, what am I doing? 
I just feel, it just feels hopeless. And then I look at our own community. I don't know if you know that we now have three active dispensaries for marijuana in our community. The homeless rate has gone up in our community. We have now over 100 homeless people. I'm thinking, what, do we want to become a little San Francisco? No. We have syringes and all these other drug addicts and everybody else around here bring in the casino and we'll just kind of jack it up. That reminds me, if you're against the casino, you can sign the petition in the connection desk. We, we collected signatures last week. We're still going on. There's an overwhelming outcry from our community against the casino, but uh, we'll see. But I'm just saying, and then I look at all the political, I look at the social, look at the economic, and I'm just like, I just, I just felt fatigued. I just, I just felt overwhelmed. Like, God, this is, this is, this is a fantasy. And so I was just reading through this uh, scriptures, and I felt like the Lord gave me these words. So this message came out of that sense that I was going through. And I just wanted to share it with you. So let me just talk to you about this as we'll read the scripture in just one more moment. Let me just give you another background. Is how many of you have ever done something for God and bad things happen to you because you were doing something for the Lord? <laughs> Nobody wants to also be honest. Okay, maybe you're not doing anything for the Lord. Maybe, maybe you need to check <laughs> things out. But I, I, was, I was asked to go to the hospital, not to visit to somebody in our, in our church, but to visit a family member of somebody who was in our church. Does everybody understand that? So I am like, fine, I will go. So I'm going to the hospital, the tight, uh, tight parking spaces. I pull in. I'm very careful not to get the car next to me. You know, I got it all set. I open the car door just gently, and a gust of wind hit my door and ripped it out of my hand, and I slammed into the car next to me. And I'm like, no. And I get out and look, and there's a huge dip. So I did what you did. I got in my car and drove off. No. <laughs> no, I did not do that. I uh, put my name, put my number on there, apologize to the people. I'm so sorry. It was not intentional, but, you know, I didn't go through the whole story, but here it is. Just call me. And so sure enough, a couple days later, I get a call. And it was an older couple, and uh, thank goodness I went to one of our local guys, Jack Galloway, took care of me, and I got the car in, and we got take, take care of it. But I was like, I'm going to the hospital to visit this person, and this is what happens to me. Or like this past Friday, I went downtown to uh, be with the student group, and they got some great plans. We'll talk about that in the coming days and weeks. And I'm going down there, and I forgot to pay the parking meter. And we were gone for hours just with the student groups. So I come back and I'm like, no, I was just dreading every moment of it. Well, I got in there and the, it, wasn't a part, it wasn't a meter maid, it was a meter man. He just got in there, he goes, today's your lucky day. I just got here and you're free to go. And I was like, yes, yes, I did get fined. But I'm saying that when you're doing things for God, sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes you encounter bad stuff. And so we read this story in the scriptures in 1 Samuel chapter 30. To give you the background as we go ready to set the scriptures, is that David was doing God's will. God had anointed him. God had called him. God had challenged him uh, to be the king of Israel. So he said, okay, God, I'll do that. I'll be the king of Israel. And uh, from that point on, his life was a living mess. The king decided that David was, should not be king and he was going to take him out. And David was hunted and he was chased. He was pursued. So here's a guy that's just trying to serve God and all he gets is trouble. And he's going through all this stuff. And so he finally decides it's so bad that he decides he's going to move. Like many people in our great state of Pennsylvania have moved out of state. I don't, won't go through all the details with that, but we have a mass migration of bodies leaving our state. And I'm saying to you, the difference between what God wants to do and where we're at right now is up to the church to pray. This Thursday, we have a national day of prayer. Hope everybody has a chance to attend. We'll be having a service here at noon, and you're welcome to come and pray with us as we pray for our nation. Anyway, so some of the things that are going on is that David is, is being pursued, and he finally decides, I'm leaving Israel, and I'm going to go live with an enemy, the Philistines. 
And so he goes over there, he's living there, and they say, here, take this fortified city called Ziglag. You're going to live with the Philistines. Here you go. And so David is doing raids. He's, he's wiping out all the enemy uh, territories that he can, and no one knows that he's, he's secretly, like, still for Israel, but he's wiping out all these enemy, uh, enemy groups. And so he's doing God's will. Does everybody follow this? He's doing God's will. He's doing God's purposes. He's pursuing God. And here's what the result is. If you read this in 1 Samuel chapter 30, follow along with me in verses 1 through 8. It says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag, the city that they were put in, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziglag. They attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and his people who were with him were lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, have been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the uh, ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, the Lord answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. And you read the story, and it goes on to tell you some things that David did. It was exactly what the Lord said. But I want to come back to the beginning is that the Amalekites were descendants of the son Esau, who was, you know, the twin brother of Jacob. And they were enemies all their days against the uh, people of Israel. The Amalekites were a raiding brand, a nomad brand that traveled all over and just did plundered and pillaged. That's how they made their living was robbing others. The Amalekites were the ones, if you remember the story of Moses, when they had their first encounter in battle, that Moses went up on the hill to pray and had Aaron and Hur raise his hands up. It was the Amalekites that they were fighting against. Uh, the Amalekites have always been a thorn in the flesh to the people of God. And it says that David and his men were out doing the will of God. And when they came back, these dirty, rotten, you know, enemies of Israel had burned their little city to the ground, had captured all their plunder, all their animals, all their livestock, and their children, and their wives, and taken them captive. And it says the people were so distressed that they cried so much they had no more strength left to cry. And it said not only that, it said that they were, uh, that they even got so embittered, they talked of stoning David, the one who killed Goliath, the hero David, they talked to stoning him. And the Lord just began to speak to me as I was reading through this story that some of you in this room have had a zigzag moment where you've been doing the will of God, standing on the will of God, and you're trying to serve God, and things just go wrong. Could be your marriage. Thought it was going to last, didn't. Could be your sons and daughters. You're praying for them and believing God for them, and they go astray. It could be that God spoke to you about a business deal, that you were supposed to go into business, and you and maybe your partner, maybe your proprietor, you're going into business for yourself, and it failed. Maybe you're in a place where you're just going through a health issue, and you're believing God and trusting God, and you're asking God for healing and deliverance and asking God for victory, and all you've got is just more bills, more pills, and it looks like your body condition is getting worse. Maybe you're in a place where you're going through where you've just had some family relationships, and I've just heard the Lord speak this so clearly to me that, you know, maybe you've been believing God and trusting God and speaking the Word of God for family members, and all you've gotten is a lot of obstacles and rejection and refusals. Maybe you're in a place this morning where you realize that, you know, Pastor Mitch, I've, I realize my zig, like I've been trying to serve God and love God, thought I was going for God, and, you know, just got fired from my job. I can list just numerous things 
that people are going through. Or it could be like in church life, things go wrong and people just blame the pastor. That's always a joy. I could go through story after story after story. And it's like, if you don't know how to encourage yourself in the Lord, you will not receive what God has for you. And it'll be the Lord wants to teach us how to encourage ourselves in Him. It'll be the Lord gives us some keys in what we need to do. And the Bible says that when David encouraged himself in the Lord, he then said to the priest, bring the ephod. That was a linen vestment that had the uh, umen and the thumbin on it. And there's those things that uh, they would use to be, seek, if you would, divination. They would not in a bad way, but they would seek God's counsel. And they would, it was what the high priest wore. The priest would wear these vestures, uh, garments. And so they would use that to say, God, what is your will? So David encouraged himself in the Lord. He got encouraged in the Lord. And what happened? He went to seek God. When he went to seek God, then God began to give him direction. And it was the exact opposite of what I would have thought. God told him to pursue his enemies. God told him to overtake them. And God said, without fail, you're going to capture them. And so David had to choose whether he's going to believe that word or not. And I'm here to encourage you this morning. You either believe what God tells you if you get a word from God or you don't. Lord says you're going to prosper and everything goes wrong. What can you say? Let me tell you this story. If, if Reba gets mad at me, I don't know where she is, but anyway, wherever she is. <laughs> but uh, we, have, we have after church today, we have a, uh, the seniors have a get-together, the boomer group. And so she was cooking, the, the, getting ready to cook the dinner. And so I'm sitting in the living room, and, and all of a sudden she says, help, it's on fire, it's on fire. And I turn around, and the big soup pot has flames just shooting out of it. And I'm looking at this thing, and she's throwing salt on it. Finally got baking soda, and she put it out. But that was after the uh, center light uh, lamp cover fell off. It was plastic. It broke. It shattered. Stuff is everywhere. And I'm like, you know what? We're trying to do things for God. <laughs> now I've got to go get a new light fixture. <laughs> fell off. Broke over. And Ruby's an excellent cook. She's a great cook. I said, I said, well, I'm sorry about that, but I guess the pan is gone. And, uh, you know, the fire's leaking out. You know, had to open all the doors and windows and get the smoke detectors. Everything's going off because everything's going crazy. And I'm just like, you know, there are times when you do things for the Lord and it doesn't work out. And you get discouraged. And you feel flat. And the Lord just wants just to encourage you this morning. Learn how to strengthen yourself in the Lord. So let me tell you what the Bible is very clear about. The Bible wants us to pursue Him. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, and this will be the longest point of the three points, pursue, overcome, or overtake, and then without fail, capture all. But I'm going to spend some time on this first one because you need to hear this. The Bible talks about things that we're pursuing. It talks about things that we're to chase after. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12, 14. Listen to this verse. Pursue peace with all people. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let me just put the line out here real clear. Only two people made it into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. Nobody else made it in. The Bible is very clear. It says wide, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. My fear is that in the American church, we have so watered down the gospel right. that you hear preachers preaching what I call wokeism, and it's not the gospel. Right. Let me just pause here for a second. I'm about to get wild up again. <laughs> if, if we believe that there's systemic racism in America, and there is, in different places, different pockets, the answer is not talking about racism in a sense. The answer is going to the root of the racial feelings, which is why do you feel like you're superior or inferior to another ethnicity? Because in Christ, we've all been made alike. In Christ, we've all been made the same. 
So to me, the issue is not racism. That's the fruit. That's the problem. The root is you need a changed heart. The root is you need the gospel of Jesus Christ to penetrate your life so that you can understand that your bigotry and your prejudice and your pride and your arrogance doesn't work in the kingdom of God. I think I've shared this story before, but just real quick, I was working, uh, this is back in my college days, I was working, which obviously was a while ago, but I was working in Pizza Hut, and I had a guy that was working with me, and he was a racist. He was a Klan member. I know I was living in Kentucky, but he was a Klan member. And this dude was giving me track after track after track on how the people of color were ruining America. And he was giving me all this stuff about how that, uh, you know, the answer was white supremacy. So we're working side by side. We're cooks. I'm cooking, you know, I'm cooking my pizzas. He's cooking and whatever. We're doing back and forth. And he's giving me all this stuff. And then on top of it all, he claimed he was Christian. And I just told him, I said, sir. I didn't call him sir. I said, whatever his name was. We'll make up one, David. I said, David, you are not a Christian. You cannot have that kind of hatred in your heart and love God. It doesn't work. You're going to have to go one or the other because it doesn't work. So I'm telling you right now, you are not a believer. And you know what? If we had more people, they just simply, you don't have to say in an arrogant way because I had the guy's ear. I was talking to him. You know, it's one like I, I mean, every day we would work together for a few hours and he'd give me all of his tracts and I would read them. And I'd give him the gospel, give him the word of God, counter what he had to say. If we had more people who had faith and confidence in the gospel, that is the answer to every problem you face as mankind. It is the answer, the gospel. So we have too busy as churches, we're too busy caught up in pursuing other things. So the Bible says we're what? To pursue what? Peace. With how many people? All people pursue peace. Let me tell you what the Bible says the world seeks and according to Matthew 6, 32. It says the world seeks things. It says the world pursues things. What do they pursue? What they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, and what they're going to wear. And I see a lot of people in our church community we're pursuing the same things. And there's what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1. It says pursue love. Talking about 1 Corinthians 13, unconditional agape love. Pursue love with eagerness. Make it your goal. This is out of the Amplified Bible. Yet earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts to be used by believers for the benefit of the church. But especially that you may prophesy to foretell the future, to speak a new message from God to the people. God says that you're what? To pursue love. So you're to pursue peace, pursue love. And let me give you a third thing, and we're close. It says this, 1 Timothy 6, 11, But you, man of God... Flee from all this. And he's talking about division. He's talking about argumentatives. He talks about pursuing, uh, getting into conversations about genealogy and doctrinal issues that aren't essential to the gospel. He said, pursue or flee all these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So what are you to pursue? Peace, pursue love. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Those are the things that God has called us to pursue. And if we're not pursuing those things, I would encourage you that you probably in a zigzag moment will not be able to get the results that God has for you because you're pursuing the wrong things. He didn't say pursue revenge. He didn't say, listen to me, he didn't say hang on to your unforgiveness. He didn't say hang on to your bitterness and how you got ripped off and cheated and defrauded. Trust me, I have, a, I have tons of stories that I could share you. And I'm just saying to you, you cannot allow bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness to hold you. You've got to pursue other things. Don't pursue those things. Don't let our culture mandate to you. Did you realize that uh, it came up in the Epic Times, which is a kind of a newspaper and, uh, it was dated 42822, that many of our universities have what they call trans closets. 
And this is where they allow people who want to change the trans or in, uh, transition, a person who wants to transition from one sex to the other, that they now have it set up. It's been at Penn State for years that uh, they have trans closets. So if you're a male and you want to be female, they have the special clothing that you can go and you can identify as a female. They have it now that if you're a, uh, if you're a female and identify as a male, they have clothing for you, and this has been going on at Penn State for years. And the church, we just take it. And I'm here to say, you know what? People who are in transition, listen to me. Listen to me. There's something in their life that they don't like about themselves. And what I'm trying to say is we don't hate that person. But Jesus can set them free from the self-hatred. And if you look at the kids who've gone through the different changes where they've uh, transitioned with the hormones and the surgeries and so on, the suicide rate is in the 90 percentile. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's an act of hatred for you as a believer to know Jesus, to see someone who's going through a transition. I am wonderfully and beautifully made. You get it all. So when you look in the mirror and you see defects and flaws, it's okay. Say, Lord, I'm yours. And you allow the Lord to love on you, allow the Lord to encourage you. You're the way he's made you. You're just, you're in a place where you have to enjoy. God put you in human history at this time because he needs you. He needs your talents and your gifts and your abilities. He needs your heart for him. He needs your kindness and your compassion and your love. He needs the things that you bring to our culture. He says, I need you. That's why you're alive for such a time as this. That's why you're alive for such a time as this. Yeah. I've buried a lot of people this last year. I, I do not like death. I do not like sickness or disease. And neither does God. Right. And when you have people who are filled with the Spirit of God, people who understand the purposes of God, people who understand how to pursue peace, how to pursue righteousness and holiness, and people who know how to engage and be able to say, Jesus, use me in a supernatural way. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God opens the doors and supernatural things begin to follow your ministry. And God begins to give you words of knowledge and words of wisdom and words of insight and prophecy. And God begins to use you in discernment and uh, being able to uh, recognize unclean spirits in people. And you're able to help get people delivered. You're able to break off the fear and the fatigue and the anxiety and the dread that people have. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God has so filled you that you're able to pursue, you're able to overcome, and you're able to without fail capture and bring back the captives. That's what Isaiah 60 is all about. The Spirit of the Lord is on me to set the captives free. That's why Jesus has anointed you with the Holy Spirit and with power, went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Emmanuel, God is with us. And I'm here just to stir you up this morning. God says to pursue him, chase after him, find him, let him encourage you. Then it says you're going to be an overcomer. You're going to overtake. Now, there's something that's going on here is, I don't know about you, but maybe you've been praying for things and it hadn't worked. I heard a guy say this the other day. He says, you know, some churches, and I was reading this in the paper a while ago, there's a church in town that's been here for over 50 years, and they've never grown one person. They've stayed right at 120 people for 50 years. We've had hundreds and hundreds of people we've prayed for, ministered to, sent out because we believe we're to be a sending church. We believe we're going to get you in, bring a foundation to your life, help you grow in the things of God. And then if you have to leave, like a lot of people who are going up the corporate ladder, they have to move to other places. We'll send you out and you can be a blessing wherever you go. Amen. But I believe that the kingdom of God is more than just our little church. I believe the kingdom of God is more than our building and our facility. I believe the kingdom of God is so much greater than what we're envisioning. And so God is speaking to us and God is challenging us uh, to lay foundations in people's lives. What are the foundations? It's the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Just went through this Bible study up in Bucknell with these students, and they're learning Lordship. Lordship means Jesus is first. And that always leads you into evangelism. Oh, there's a big word. That means that you're so excited about Jesus and his love and his life is so contagious in you 
but it just spills out everywhere you go. My wife and I, just to give you another story, we were uh, usually on Saturdays, we'll get our bikes and we'll go ride, find some flat trails or something. And so we'll go find some trails to ride bikes. So we're pulled up in the parking lot and we're pulling the, uh, we're pulling the bikes off the back of the car. And there's these two young guys across the parking lot and they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about the Bible. And these guys are talking about Jesus. Yeah. Oh, but it gets even better. I had a chance to go hit some golf balls yesterday. So I got out there all by myself. There's nobody around. Had my cell phone, so I just crank up worship music. So I got my worship music, and I'm just hitting golf balls, just enjoying life. And all these guys started coming up, and they want to hit golf balls. Well, I was the first one there, and I had the music going. And I started thinking, maybe I need to turn it off, turn it down. I thought, you know what? No, they're going to worship with me. So all six of us are out there, just, and, and they're just... They're just listening to my music as we're singing Bethel worship songs. And, you know, just, they're just listening to my music as we're singing Bethel worship songs and, you know, all kinds of worship and praise and stuff like that. And I just thought, you know, you're not being offensive. No one said a word, but there's something about taking Jesus with you everywhere you go. There's something about just letting the Lord go with you as you go do things. He likes to be included in your life. And you include the Lord in your life, all of a sudden you realize, man, this is fun. God has good things in store for me. God has purposes for my life. And you realize it just flows out. It's not like I have to go share with people. I get to go share with people. I get to find out how Jesus can meet people's needs. I can just tell you all the people we pray with and minister to, and God's just doing some amazing things. We've got some, we've got some allies in other school districts, even out of our county, that are taking a stand for the things of God. Now, I will not give you all the details, but I'm telling you, the tide is changing when it comes to our school systems. The tide is changing. Let me just stop and just share this one point, and we're going to pray in just a second. The Bible records that David had 600 men with him when he was told to go pursue the enemy. So David takes off with his guys. It takes them three days. They find the enemy. And it says, but on the journey, 200 of his men said, we can't go any further. We're wiped out. We're tired. You can read it in 1 Samuel 30. We cannot go another step. You wore us out, David. David took his other 400 men. They went. They found the Amalekite raiding band, destroyed them except for a few guys, brought back all the captives, all the spoil, brought it all back. They come back to where the 200 men had been left at the stream. And the guys who'd gone into battle told the guys back by the baggage, look, you get your wives and kids and that's it. You don't get any of the plunder. And David said this. He said, no. Those who stay by the baggage get to divide the spoil just like those who go into battle. Church, listen to me. Maybe God's given you the gift of intercession. Maybe you're a prayer warrior and you're staying there and you're praying and speaking the word. Or maybe you're like a lot of people. You've been fighting fights and you're just exhausted. And sometimes you need your brothers and sisters to come along beside you and pull you through to victory. Sometimes you need people to stand with you as you're going through certain situations in life. And I'm here to encourage you this morning that the word that God gave me, and I saw it so clearly, this is like weeks ago, I saw this. The Lord said that you, Mitch, are to encourage people to pursue me They're going to overtake, overcome the obstacles, and without fail, they're going to get victory. Without fail, they're going to get victory. So I began to think about that. I began to think, well, how does that work? How do you, you know, how do you get victory? And I just realized a lot of it is internal things in our own heart. You know, when you you come back to Ziglag and it's been burned with fire, and everything that you had dreamed of was going to happen is gone and you've been completely wiped out and it says they were so grieved they cried and cried these grown warrior men cried and cried till they could not cry anymore and their whole thought that I heard the Lord speak to me so clearly to strengthen yourself in the Lord we're going to have a moment where have you guys come up and you're going to pursue the word of God for your situation. And you're going to speak the word of God to your situation. And you're going to overtake 
the enemy, and without fail, you're going to capture all. God's going to restore to you everything that Satan has stolen from you. Let me give you a scripture, and this is for the music team. They can come up now. Uh, 1 John 5, 4 says this, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. You know, the Bible tells us also in 2 Samuel twenty two thirty six. 36, it says, You, God, have given me your shield of victory. You, God, have given me what? Your shield of victory. I can tell you this. There's something about pursuing things and going after God that he just ignites for you. Just such a joy. David was devastated. His men were talking to stoning him. He knew his source was in God. He went to God, got before God, got a word from God, said, God, give me your word. God said, I want you to pursue, overtake, and capture all. And I heard the Lord say that for this morning, for this altar call. You're going to pursue, you're going to overtake, you're going to capture all. And here's some of the categories that the Lord spoke to me about. And this is for those that are here that are serving Jesus. I heard a lot of people have lost a lot of things, such as the loss of innocence. There's been a lot of people who've been harmed and hurt either. Not, people, we always think in terms of sexually, but there's also a loss of innocence when it comes to serving Jesus, loving Jesus, and then things go haywire. Somebody does something wrong, somebody says something wrong, you get offended by other people, and you lose your innocence. Keep your innocence. The Bible says we're to be childlike. That went over good. Be childlike in your faith. Uh, relationships. I heard the Lord say this about friendships, that people have lost relationships and friendships. I specifically saw this, and if I've been counseling you, I'm not speaking to you, but if I haven't been counseling you, then this is for you, is that uh, I saw this specifically in family relationships where there's been a fracture. And I saw it specifically between parent and child, like adult children with parents, that there's been this fracture, and I see the Lord restoring relationships. The Lord's going to bring it back together. I uh, also heard the Lord speak to me about uh, maybe you've lost loved ones, uh, even through death or certain other things that you've lost the relationship with loved ones. The Lord's going to bring that back. I also heard the Lord speak to me about finances. He's going to bring finances back to those who lost finances. People have lost their health. The Lord's going to restore your health. I heard the Lord say for people who feel isolated and alienated, the Lord's going to bring you back into community, just like David did when the men at the baggage, the men who went to war, they came back together. They brought community, great victory for them. I also hear things spiritually speaking, and I'm going to take a moment for this. I hear the Lord saying he's going to restore faith to people who've lost faith. I hear the Lord say he's going to restore hope to people who've lost hope. And I hear the Lord saying he's going to produce security for people who feel insecure. I also hear the Lord saying if you pursue him, he's going to give you vision, gifts, and calling. The Lord's going to do all that. So if you're lacking any of those things, if you guys would just stand with me for just a moment. I don't want to rush this. We'll take just a few more minutes. We're about done. But I just want to be sensitive to the Lord. Because if you've lost some things this morning, you're online with us this morning. You can be a part with what we're doing. Uh, if you're here in this, what I would like to encourage you is when you pursue something, if you would like to, tell you what, let me do this first. Let's just take a moment. If you don't know Jesus, let's just bow our heads before I give the altar call. Let's just bow our heads and just ask Jesus where you stand with him. If there's anything in your life between you and Jesus, we sang it earlier, Lord, there's nothing better than you. If there's something in your life better than Jesus, then I would encourage you to change. And the way you change is through repentance. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. I've put this above you. For people who love Jesus, it's called idolatry. For people who don't know Jesus, we would encourage you. It's called just being saved, giving your heart to Christ. So either way, the prayer goes like this, saying, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to fill me. Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. So that starts the journey. So like David had a relationship with God. He could go to God because he had a relationship with him. Now, if you're here this morning and you've got a relationship with the Lord, and maybe you've had a, what I call a zigzag moment, I'm here to tell you victory is in the camp. And the way you're going to pursue and overcome without fail 
It's like David was commissioned by God to go after him. So how we do it in church and in this altar call is you're going to come forward. It's going to be between you and God. And you're going to speak to that issue that's that zigzag moment in your life. Whatever it is the Lord's put on your heart. If it's vision, if it's dreams, if it's hope, if it's calling, that sort of thing. If it's the loss of things that you need to recover. If it's friendships, relationships, if it's business, financial, whatever is going on in your life. And you'd say, Pastor Mitch, yeah, I've got a zigzag moment. You come forward now. This is your moment for you to stand before God at this altar. We're making this an altar part. And this is between you and your God to be that zigzag moment to say, Jesus, I'm going to pursue. You're going to give me direction. I'm going to overcome. God, I'm going to see you do some amazing things in these relationships in my family. God, I'm letting go of all the unforgiveness and bitterness. Yeah, just come on up, church, because this is your altar call. We're not going to sit here for the rest, of the rest of the morning. This is between you and your God. But if there's something in your heart that you need to get out, this is your moment to say, God, I'm standing before you this morning. I've heard the word of the Lord. I've heard the, the man of God speak, and you promised me that if I would pursue you, if I would seek the things of you, if I would go after you, you would restore all these things to me. Now, I've got a family situation. I've got a financial situation. I've got a health situation. I've, got, I've tried to serve you, and things went wrong. God, I am standing before you this morning. And I'm pursuing you, and I'm going to overtake, and without fail, I'm going to walk in victory. Without fail, I'm going to walk as an overcomer. Without fail, God, I'm pursuing you for spiritual gifts and dreams and vision. God, I'm standing before you this morning. This is between you and your God this morning, and you can just under your breath, no one else has to know what's going on, but you take that problem. You take the situation that's in your life. Take the, take the thing that's got you that you just realize it's, it's your zigzag moment. You've been burned. You've been, uh, things have been devastated in that area. You say, God, just give me your word. What is a word I can stand on? Pursue peace with all men. Don't let unforgiveness and bitterness rise up. I'm telling you, I fight it all the time. Things just come up, and I start to feel resentment and bitterness, and I'm like, nope, can't go there. The Bible says we're to love our enemies. The Bible says we're to bless those who curse us. The Word of God tells us that we are to honor all government positions. I could go on with a long list of convicting things, but that's enough. But this is between you and the Lord. So church, I need you to just, just go ahead and just speak it out. This is your moment. This is your time of being like David. You're standing before the Lord, saying, I've got this situation in my life, and I need to pursue you. I need to get direction from you. And I'm going to overcome the obstacles that are holding me back. And what I saw in the Spirit, and I saw this so clearly, and I want... I just saw somebody in our church who I know very well. I know there's a relationship going on with their family. And I just saw the Lord just taking this moment and just giving them such a supernatural love for their family. And it was able to overcome the barriers and the resentment that was there. I said, Jesus, that's so amazing. I saw other people who've just been sitting, if you would, bag by the baggage, just exhausted. Life has wore you out. You've been completely and totally run over and this is your moment to allow other people to come alongside you and say hey we're going to fight for you we're going to fight the victory we're going to press on we'll go fight the enemy on your behalf we're going to stay with you we're going to come back we're going to divide the spoil together we're going to rejoice greatly over what you're doing lord jesus father we thank you for this moment church i just encourage you those who've responded you're down front this is between you and the lord you just keep going. People that are standing in your seats, would you just continue to pray for those of us down front that just need God to give us that sense of victory. Lord, we thank you that we know what the problem is. We know what the situation is. We now ask for the solution. And we thank you that we will pursue. We will overtake. And without fail, we will conquer all. Father, we thank you for vision and dreams this morning. Father, I pray for those. If that's you, just raise your hand. Lord, I just pray for vision and dreams to come upon those that have come forward needing from you, a word from you. Father, I thank you that you, have, you said that your gifts and callings are irrevocable without repentance. 
So, Father, I thank you that you who started a good work in us will complete it. I thank you for those that started off serving you and following you, and maybe they got injured, hurt, corrupted uh, by maybe uh, bad people or bad church people or whatever. Father, I pray that you'd restore to them the innocence, restore to them the joy, restore to them just the privilege of just serving you, Jesus. Father, I pray for those that are going through, uh, Lord, maybe just trying to discern what their calling and giftings are, that, Father, you just make it very clear that you would begin to put them on the path that you've designed them for. Father, I pray for those that have gone through some financial loss this morning. Father, I pray that you begin to restore. I pray that you've told us in Malachi that what the uh, Lord, what has been taken by the enemy, that you'll restore back. You've told us in Proverbs, even up to a sevenfold return. So, Father, I speak it over this congregation. I speak it over this church. I declare in Jesus' name, those of us who've suffered financial loss, those of us who've had financial setbacks, those of us who've, uh, Lord, living in a time and an age of uh, uncertainty when it comes to finances and financial future, that, Father, I thank you that you're going to prosper your people. I thank you in the midst of inflation, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all these issues, that God, you're going to prosper your people in Jesus' name. Father, we also declare this morning that, Lord, you're doing a sense of uh, an act of restoration. I just see some health conditions just being reversed. Father, I just thank you for reversing those health conditions now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, as Brother Jeff shared earlier, that he had a back problem and he began to worship you and began to sing to you and the Lord, that you brought a healing to his back this morning. Father, we thank you this morning that you're doing healings in Jesus' name. Lord, heal, restore, set free in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'll just encourage you this morning while we're here. We're not going to drag this out. But please, church, if there's any unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, please, please, please release it to the Lord. Don't hold on to that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now the Bible tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You should be feeling a sense, a note rising in your heart of victory, one that is mission accomplished. It's our uh, God, just thank you so much that my problem, my situation, you've identified, you've corrected, you've given me direction what to do to pursue you, you've told me how to overtake, and I'm going to, without fail, recover all. Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. I receive that as a word of the Lord for me this morning. Father, I thank you that we're able to, without fail, recover all. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. We thank you for restoring relationships and family relationships. We thank you for uh, doing some incredible things in those areas. Father, I thank you for those who have a sense of grieving and loss over loved ones. That, Father, you just restore to them the wholeness. That, God, we know one day, if you don't come back, Jesus, we'll go see them and we'll be with them forever and ever in heaven. Father, I pray you just fill up those empty hearts in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for those who have just been exhausted. Just through life, the fatigue, as we addressed earlier in worship, I'm coming back to it again, that, God, that you would continue to do some amazing things, that, God, you just fill their cup up. Lord, let the, let the Holy Spirit, the rivers of living water, come bubbling up. I just see it bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up. If that's you, just raise your hands. Just receive to say, God, just fill me, fill me, fill me. Fill me to overflowing, Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing. Let the joy of the Lord be my strength. Father, let the praise of God be in my mouth. Let the two-edged sword be in my hand. God, let the praises of God be with me. God, just thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for filling me up. Thank you, Jesus, that I walk in victory. Thank you, Jesus, that defeat is not an option. Thank you, Jesus, failure is not an option. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm an overcomer. Thank you, Jesus, that the greater one lives inside of me. Thank you, Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Therefore, death, hell, demons can't stop you from using me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. I feel like it's a time of celebration. Just tell the Lord you love him. Tell him you're so thankful to be his child. Tell him you're so glad that he's called you, equipped you, anointed you. Thank him so much. You've gone through your zigzag moment. You've come out on the other side. 
You've been burned. You've gone through bad times. You've been devastated, but you didn't quit. You didn't give up. You didn't turn your back on God. Didn't turn your back on the church. You said, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm here. Use me. Let me serve you, love you, encourage you. God, whatever you've called me to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Church, let's give the Lord a big hand. Let's give a big shout of victory. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah.